Okay. Right, I shall move quite quickly through my slides. Um, please go online if you haven't already and read our annual report. It reflects what the society is doing on your behalf. To be legal, we need to ascertain which members are attending the AGM. So those in Betchett's society, please vote now on the quick poll. How many have we got, Victor? How's it looking? Great, fantastic. I'll crack on. Oh, my slide isn't working for some reason. Sorry, Tony. If you go down there on your screen, yep. th there's a Yes? Yep. No, I should be able to. I was using hard return. Apologies. Um, right, so this is the schedule. So it's really quite short and sharp. First, a reminder of your trustees who have remained stable over three years now. However, our previous chair, Richard West, has just stood down. Richard had worked, has worked tirelessly over many years and needs to take a break and I'm most grateful for his steadfast efforts and assistance to me personally. Our fantastic support staff noted here with Gemma and Deborah being our only paid members of staff who are paid part-time. I think you will agree that Claire Griffiths does a fantastic job with our newsletters with the assistance of our Honorary Secretary, Judy Scott. We continue to welcome additional trustees offering additional skills. Clarity of purpose and coherence have not changed. Much of the wider visibility has been achieved online this year. As COVID-19 has taken its toll on face-to-face -face conferences and meetings. I have attended a myriad of Zoom meetings, partly so that the name of Betchett's UK is widely seen about the place. Lady Margaret Ritchie is doing a fantastic job as our patron. Trustees work hard to represent the membership, therefore mutual engagement is vital. And that's what that last presentation was about. Helpline calls are reducing, which in many ways is a good sign. Thank you to those who have completed the PSP survey. We've had 49 responses so far, so please everyone else do the same. This gives the process authority, acknowledged by researchers and funders alike, that it represents the patient view. It will then be exposed to our clinicians for their view. The future guideline is an important mechanism to encourage BAD and, and BSR members to adhere to a nice accredited guideline across the UK, which will have a substantial difference to the extant EULA guideline in order to match our specific UK Beshets population. Great thanks on your behalf to Richard, Tony and Andrea for all their past assistance. And thank you to Yvonne, Fiona uh, and, and Rachel for your continued support. Deborah is doing a great job in raising visibility at every opportunity that presents itself. And thank you all for the marvellous fundraising that you achieve. And Alan Lane will brief on this in detail in a minute. This is what today is all about. Dr. Priyanka Chanrata will brief this afternoon on the epidemiological study that will be a vital catalyst in all this and help consolidate all the accumulated knowledge in the three centres of excellence. Whilst I remain ever conscious that when you are not in flair, you wish to crack on with your lives and leave Betchett's in the rear view mirror or actually off the very road you're traveling on. But it will nevertheless need your involvement when we need to collect data 
You heard from Daniel Louis what can be achieved, which is why I wanted to hear his cat's journey. Gemma has done a great interim refresh on the website to align with modern web technology. We will need a new website in due course with wider fun functionality, online sales and such things like that. With the uh, support of Baroness Ritchie, progress is being made in Northern Ireland and we seek to do the same in Wales and Scotland. We need to achieve a more predictable revenue stream, however, notwithstanding the fantastic contribution that members continue to make. Again, I encourage you to read the full report. Many thanks for your attention. Alan, over to you. Thank you, Tony, and hello, everyone. Before starting to look at the finances of the society, which is the Treasurer's job, I'd just like to say a few things about ourselves, the members of the society. Normally, when we meet, I'm always conscious at the annual meeting that it's the first time some people have attended. In fact, it can be the first time that some people have ever met another patient's patient. So I like to start by just saying a few things about who we are. And we are a community of over a thousand people, uh, full members, a few junior members, a few associates, donors, and uh, a few who are sadly uh, currently regarded as lapsed because we haven't had any subscription recently. Junior members are under 18. But if you compare those numbers with a year ago, you'll see that we continue to have a steady increase in our numbers. Most interesting to me was that the number of junior members went up by 50%. And that's due to the greater involvement in social media that we've been having as a society in the last couple of years. So of these people, over a thousand are patients, some of us, like myself, are classed as supporters uh, because we like to help. Um, some are carers of patients, some are medical staff, and a small number of our members, and quite a small number, are living overseas. We are mostly in our 40s and 50s, but there are quite a few who are a bit younger and a good number who are a bit older, but our average age remains at about 50. We live throughout the United Kingdom, we bet it's UK after all, and it's no surprise that the largest number of our members are in England, it's, it's the largest bit in terms of population, but we do have decent numbers as well in the other home nations, and even a small contingent in the Channel Islands. So those are some facts about who we are. One thing that always puzzles me is that three quarters of us are female, and I don't know why that is. It's not surprising that most of us in this day and age get our newsletters by email, that's a number that's been going up. And quite a large proportion now are in receipt of state benefits or pensions, which entitles them to free membership. That's a number that's going up and I'm afraid in the present circumstances nationally, it's probably likely to go up even more. But for some people, you can gift aid your subscriptions if you pay and if you pay tax and we can get the tax back from the government, which is always a nice thing to do. If you aren't doing this and think you could, do contact the, the office by email or ringing the office number and we will send you the relevant form to fill in. We are not increasing the subscription. We haven't increased it for 10 years. In fact, it remains at £20 a year. And we increased our uh, allowance for giving charitable grants to members uh, two years ago uh, and although typically they're in a uh, maximum of about £500 uh, we do have a maximum limit now of £1,000 for uh, helping people with household equipment, mobility equipment and that sort of thing. Further details and application forms can be obtained from our contact numbers. So that's about us, the members, uh, a little bit about the finances next. Treasurer's financial report. How much money do we have as a charity? Well, if you go back three or four years, 
I was saying we had too much in hand. This blue line at the top shows the balance we had at the end of the financial year, about £80,000 in 2016, 2017. And we set out to hold no more than between about six months and about 12 months of our normal income. So trustees took that message on board and said, well, in that case, we'd better do more. We increased our part-time staff from one to two. We increased our presence in social media. We increased what we were able to do in terms of charitable grants to members. And we started spending more as a result of which our balance went down and down. And then last year, as treasurer, I was saying, hang on, we can't go on like that or we shall run out of funds. Now, what happened this year was remarkable. It's been an astonishing year altogether. We were planning to have a trustees meeting in March, at which we were going to have to face up to some very difficult decisions about how we could stop our expenditure running ahead of our income. And then suddenly we went into lockdown. And, and in between then and when we were going to have our trustees meeting, which then turned out to be a Zoom one, an astonishing thing happened. For over two years, we'd been going through various legal procedures regarding the estate of a member who died and left us some money. And in the middle of March, we suddenly received a cheque for £100,000, which was the largest donation in the society's history by a long way. And so if you look at the balance at the end of the year that has finished, it has shot up. Now that's all very well, but it's a one-off and trustees quite wisely have decided that they've got to use that over a three-year period to sustain the activities we're already doing and a small number of additional ones, uh, including increasing the grants that we can make to members again. But it does mean that whereas I might have come along with a very dismal picture to this year's AGM, I can in fact, in this respect, come with a rosy one. So where does our income come from? Normally, the income comes from mainly subscriptions and donations from members. You see last year's picture, the grey area there, legacies, corresponding figure for the previous year would have been zero. So that's very unusual. It's subscriptions and donations which enable us to do our work normally, a smaller amount from sales, gift aid and fundraising. But without the subscriptions and donations, we wouldn't survive. The amount from government is, of course, zero. We don't get any aid in that way at all. Our expenditure is uh, not quite half, but the largest part is staff costs because they do a tremendous amount, even though there are only two part time members. And apart from that, where does the money go? Patient information and newsletter is one significant part. The annual conference and AGM, not quite as expensive this year, but uh, it was normal last year, and charitable grants. You might wonder, if you study this, why we had a large section marked governance. That was to do with the legal fees that we had to pay in order to resolve this disputed uh, estate and the bequest, which eventually came in so timely. So, uh, as well as our general fund, we have a research fund. That's uh, something which is specifically uh, allocated to supporting research in university medical departments. Some people make uh, generous donations, some are small, some are substantial. And the number goes up and down uh, quite a bit, uh, but we had one particularly large generous donation from a member in the last financial year, which was exceptional. The expenditure tends to match, sometimes a little bit later, but tends to match the income. And the generous donation that I mentioned has been earmarked for some work in a hospital this year. That leaves a little bit in hand. About 15,000 typically is kept in reserve. So if somebody comes up with an idea, under the research heading which we can support, we normally have a small amount of funds. It doesn't go a long way, I'm afraid, but we normally have a small amount of funds for that purpose. So, uh, moving on, 
we um, have a, a, an enormous debt to all the people who raise funds for the society. There's just a flavour of some of the things which took place in the last year. We're very grateful to all those wonderful people. If you read our newsletters, you'll see a great deal more about that, but there, there isn't time for me to go into detail uh, today, but uh, we are most grateful to, to all of you. Funds raising this year already has been significantly up despite the difficult circumstances we are all working in. So I'm particularly grateful for that. If you would like to help the society, there are loads of ways you can. Again, lots of detail in the newsletter on this. Obviously joining is one, uh, being a donor. Uh, we have merchandise. Uh, go to the website and have a look at the things that you can buy with Fetchit's logos on. You can shop through Amazon Smile. This will cost you nothing. And uh, if you buy things from Amazon, do use the Amazon Smile option because we get half of 1%. It may only be pennies, but a lot of pennies add up. Then uh, we have some other shopping partners which give us a small uh, commission if you buy things from them. Uh, obviously, fundraising events, very important when they happen. Not so easy just at the moment. If you sell things on eBay, again, you can donate a proportion to the society. Uh, there is a weather lottery in which you, you guess what the weather might be on a future date. Uh, that was an interesting thing in our climate. Um, and a lot of fundraising now through Facebook. That's been another big increase. So thank you very much to everybody doing that. Christmas cards are on sale at the moment. I think already more than half of them are sold. So do, uh, they're handmade um, and uh, excellent. So do buy some if you want to. And finally, well, you could always uh, put something in a will to leave legacy to the society. Let us hope this will not occur for many, many years into the future, but it might help some future members one day. So that's my treasurer's report. Thank you very much for listening. I'd now like to hand over to another one of our trustees, Rachel Humphreys. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Sorry, just sharing my screen. There we are. So I am here today to let you know who has been awarded the Judith Buckle Award for this year. It is my privilege to announce that the Judith Buckle Award 2020 is awarded to Katie and Emma Davis. As we all know, Judith Buckle was a nurse who suffered from Bechet's and strove to raise awareness and support for others with this debilitating disease by setting up the Bechet Syndrome Society in 1983, now Bechet's UK. This is exactly what Emma and Katie accomplished all their lives, helping others, whether that be through helping patients in their nursing careers or their commitment to supporting others with Bechet's disease. As recipients of the 2020 Judith Buckle Award, this could not be a more fitting tribute in honour of their memory. It recognises the enduring support and assistance that over the years, the identical twins Emma and Katie offered many fellow Bechet's UK members and patients. After Emma and Katie's sad deaths within days of each other and the national announcement on the BBC News on the 24th of April, 2020, a number of members immediately got in touch to reflect on the positive impact that the twins had on others suffering from the remitting and relapsing Bechet's disease. Their compassion always came over strongly. Many people noted that Emma and Katie routinely attended Bechet's group meetings and were active members on the Bechet's forums, always cheerful and positively sharing their experience and knowledge of the condition in order to help others. Kind and personable, they were universally liked 
and their deaths were really felt within the Beshets community. They were always interested in helping other patients and members as much as possible and often spoke to people on the phone, by text or by email. When their health permitted, they attended annual general meetings like the one we have today, patient listening days and the occasional stop at the pub with other patients after clinic. It was notable how well they interacted with others in clinic, always so friendly and bright despite their own suffering. It also serves to recognise the outstanding care, attention and humanity that Emma and Katie offered so many other individuals during their time as nurses at University Hospital Southampton and elsewhere. Representatives from University Hospital Southampton have complimented them highly. Gail Byrne, Director of Nursing at University Hospital Southampton, described Emma as an excellent nurse who was calm and cheerful and a good leader. She was well liked by all and was a valuable member of the team during her time with us. Paula Head, Chief Executive at University Hospital Southampton said, I want to pay tribute to Katie who sadly passed away. Katie has been described by her colleagues where she worked in child health as a nurse people would aspire to be like and that nursing was more than just a job to her. The Royal College of Nursing reflected she has been described as a dedicated and selfless nurse who has had time for everyone to share their skills and knowledge to ensure patient care. The award was presented to Mr and Mrs Allen and Julie Davis, accompanied by Zoe Elizabeth Davis, by Councillor David Ricardo, Mayor of Yeovil, in the Mayor's Parlour on Wednesday. This was a private ceremony due to Covid restrictions. The family have lived in Yeovil since Emma and Katie were aged eight, having moved from Bridport in Dorset, where they were born. We have received this lovely response from Julie, Alan, Zoe, Elizabeth and family, which I will share with you now. We are extremely proud and incredibly humbled to receive this very meaningful award on behalf of our beautiful girls, Emma and Katie. Betchets UK and its community has been part of our family's life for many years and have been a fundamental source of support for us all. Emma and Katie were firm believers that you should always give back to those who have given to you and they were therefore very active members of the Betchets UK community. They were both members of the online support groups and both took part in group social meetings whenever they were well enough to attend. The knowledge and caring from their nursing background always extended into their personal lives to those around them and they would always lend an ear to others in their times of trouble, imparting their wisdom wherever they felt it helpful, ensuring that others' needs were prioritised above their own. They were also always keen to participate in new research initiatives for Beshets UK and gave regular donations to the charity too. We always knew that Emma and Katie were two very special young ladies. But since leaving us too soon earlier this year, we have been quite overwhelmed by the outpouring of love and gratitude from all those whose lives they touched. To be given this award is another very poignant reminder of just how much impact they had. We are obviously incredibly heartbroken that they cannot receive this award in person, but knowing them both so well, it is incredibly likely that they would have felt they didn't deserve the recognition for what was just a matter of course to them both. And that's exactly who they were. Kind, generous and beautiful human beings who gave their all to others until the last. We cannot be proud of them or more grateful for them having been recognised by such a meaningful charity, which we fully intend to continue giving our support to. Thank you so much to all those who voted for Emma and Katie to be given this award and long may they be remembered. <laughs>